Remember when amateurs with homemade radio sets used to sit up until all hours of the night talking with other radio hams around the world? We begin our story on a day in 1943. Joe Brown and his brother Jim were seniors that year. And like thousands of other American boys, their thoughts were far from the peaceful valley country that has always been their home. Well, you can guess the rest. That Signal Corps poster caught Joe's eye, and it wasn't long before he enlisted. And two days later, Brother Jim walked into a Navy recruiting office, sore as a boil that Joe had beaten him to the punch. Dear Pop, I'm finally learning how to be a real radio man. From 8.30 in the morning until 4.15 in the afternoon, we go from one class to another. Most of the fellows are around my own age, and I mean we're getting a real education. Pop, a fellow who goes through a school like this gets training that will fit him for most any kind of communications job in what the big shots call the post-war world. The instructors are experts. Most of them have had practical experience with all kinds of radio installations. They know how to get the stuff across so it's understandable. We're taught not only how to repair a piece of equipment under any conditions, but how to build it from the ground up. Of course, the big radio manufacturers are working exclusively for the Army and Navy and keep us posted on all the latest improvements. Class and typing and code is what I like best. They shoot the messages slow at first and speed it up until you're taking 24 words a minute. That's tops. After we learn what makes the darn things tick, we get individual instruction on equipment, just the same as they have aboard ship. Pop, speaking of ships, don't think the Army boys are the only ones using walkie-talkies. We have a course in portable equipment that's just as thorough as they come. Not allowed to tell you just how we use them, but believe me, when the war's over, these sets are going to play a pretty important role in communications. Right now, they have a range of about five miles. That's only the beginning. Well, Pop, we're at the end of our fourth month here. The skipper's executive officer came into class today to read off the list of the men who've passed. Honestly, you could have heard a pin drop. Allen, Armitage, Apostopoulos, Bernica, Bernholtz, Blaine. Gosh, I thought he'd never get to my name. And suddenly he said, Jim Brown. And Pop, it was the biggest moment of my life. A full-fledged sergeant now, earning $98 a month, Joe Brown climbs aboard a radio-equipped scout car as Division X of a mythical Blue Army goes on final maneuvers before sailing overseas. Their objective, to surprise and capture an enemy airport. How radio plays its dramatic role in modern warfare is graphically portrayed as we follow a motorized striking force into the field. From his own position, Joe flashes word that the convoy is being attacked by low-flying bombers. Joe's radio report is relayed to the tank command, and reinforcements roll into action. Radio serving in many coordinator of modern battle. Artillery observation post spots the target, and by radio corrects the range for gunners miles away. Base point, 300 right, 400 short, shell Mach 1. Few short, right 4-0. At the message center, communications headquarters, Officers of the general staff are kept informed by radio of the battle's progress, are in constant touch with all commanders, know to the minute where each unit is operating in the field. A courier unable to contact his unit dashes back for the nearest portable equipment to get his message through. 
Position K, Barker, Fred, Barrier, Blue, Williams Landing, cover one. By radio, our sergeant gets the message and contacts a reconnaissance plane scouting the area. Radio, coordinating the action. Radio, making possible combined operations between all branches of the service. And by radio, a message plucked from the skies is transmitted to reinforcements waiting to be called up. Here is radio, performing swiftly and efficiently in the heat of battle. Ace point, one right, two short. Range, 4,000. Fire! Airborne, calling airborne, this is Ridgely White. Airborne, this is Ridgely White. Airport, okay to land. Come on in, over. Yes, radio flies with the paratroops. Lands with the men, ready for instant action. Calling airborne squadron two, Ridgely Black. First wave landed, come on in, over. the thousands of Joe Browns and their radios are helping us win the war. The magic of radio bridging space faster than the most powerful plane. Thanks to radio, Sergeant Joe Brown is able to report mission accomplished. Nerve center and pulse of our entire communication system are the great Army and Navy message centers in Washington. Messages to and from the high command, transmitted by voice and by code to our fighting forces in all parts of the world. Navy Department, NSS Headquarters 305, proceed with operation according to plan. This is Washington, WAR, at H hour, minus 20, execute plan Z, over. And by radio, by all the means of communication known to man, a hundred, a thousand forces begin to move. Supply depots, embarkation points, ships at sea, all ready for... H hour, minus 20, execute plan Z, over. And so, from an unnamed port, troops whose regiments shall also be nameless, board a transport that bears only a number. Plan Z is being put into operation. Dawn finds the convoy at sea. Ships, transports, war vessels spread across the ocean, moving as one. Perfect coordination affected by the magic of radio communication. Overhead, patrol planes. The Navy's big PBYs are on guard. Their crews ready to attack a lurking sub or to flash word by radio of the presence of an enemy raider. Aboard the carrier, flagship of the force, the radio room is on the alert. Promoted to radio man second class, Joe's brother, Jim Brown, is now doing sea duty with the fleet. Jim Brown, the boy from Middletown, had the duty the morning the message came through. It wasn't long before the men knew this is it. From the bridge, orders are flashed, and by loudspeakers in every part of the ship, the call is battle station. Flight deck of the flat top, the aerologist gauges the wind. The Airedales are ready for action. Now, all they've learned, all they've trained for, is put to the test. Pilots, gunners, radio men know that the honeymoon is over. This time, it's the real thing. In the radio room comes final word from the fighter squadrons. Enemy planes attacking in force.
days silent, the task force is now ready to assault the beach. In landing boats, manned by tough Coast Guard and Navy crews, they prepare for invasion. Landing with the first wave, radio units establish communication with ships offshore. And look who's here, the same Sergeant Joe Brown we last saw training in America. No training camp now. Those machine guns are spitting red-hot lead. Their job done, fighter planes return to the carrier to refuel, rearm, and stand by to repel any new attack from the sky. proceeds according to plan. Troop reinforcements, heavy equipment, big guns and amphibious tanks. Huge 155 millimeter rifles, long toms capable of hurling a shell for more than six miles go into action. Following in the wake of the artillery barrage, jungle fighters press forward, wiping out snipers and enemy pillboxes one by one. From his position ashore, Joe flashes word to the carrier in code. Beach had established. Infantry and heavy equipment landed in force. Operation proceeding according to plan. Situation well in hand. CO reports, enemy positions neutralized. Garrisons in flight. Our patrols following advantage. Yes, it could happen even in wartime. Sergeant Brown, in contact with the radio room aboard the carrier, recognizes his brother's voice. Just like the old ham days, reunion by radio, and in the middle of the South Pacific. And back in Washington, thanks to radio equipment, American men and women of industry, thanks to the courageous use of radio by the United States Army Signal Corps, and the United States Navy Communications Department of the dramatic story of radio at war.